Uh -huh. All right, well, I, anyway, I hope everybody had a good week. It's good to have everybody here. Um, oh, trying to get started here. <laughs> you know, I always enjoy being able to share, come up and talk, and, uh, whatever God puts on my heart. Um, and I, he sometimes tells me, okay, this is where I want you to go. And with this message here, um, I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. So I want to do this over here. And as I was thinking about these messages to do and trying to force my way over this one, I kept getting, nope, you're not doing that. So, okay, so, okay, okay, work on this here. No, let's go back this way. God said, nope, you're not going to do that. So, um, but this is a message that he's placed on my heart. Um, and, and, it's, and what he's been placing on my heart is lately is, is the idea of the church. And personally, I think that, um, my personal opinion, I, and I think this is the problem we're having in America, is the decline of the church right now. And I really believe that the church needs to get back to the actual God, where God's word and take a stand on it. Now, that's not particularly mean every church or every congregation, but I think as a whole, we have strayed from the Word of God. And, and, and it's not so much in just big ways, it's just little ways. Um, but what we're going to look at today, it's, just, it, it's more the idea of relationships. And, um, you know, we've all got relationships of some sort around. And they, they come in different categories. And I'm only really going to use three categories. You might have five or six categories of friends and relationships. But in, in, we have this thing in casual relationships. And this is might be classmates, um, co-workers, neighbors. You know, people that we hang out with, us, maybe we're at school or at work, we might talk to, or neighbors that we might see on occasion and share with. Um, and then we come into a next aspect of relationships. And that's what's a close relationship. And, and these people we actually do hang out. We get along with them. They have the same interests that we have. Um, people we can call when we need help for something. And we know that they'll be there. And then we come into this, the next category of relationships, and this is intimate relationships. This might be your BFFs, or which guys don't use that term. But, um, or or could be, these are friends that we know we can count on at all times. When we've got a problem, we can call them, they can be there. When we're feeling not good, we can call them up and we can talk. These are intimate friends. And in that uh, category, we have our siblings. You know, uh, your siblings, they're always going to be there. No matter how much you argue with them, how much you fight with them, how much you may not like them at this time. I've had lots of friends growing up and uh, through Cape here, where I grew up out here. Some of the friends I had there, I still see on occasion. Some of them I don't. Um, but my siblings, they're always there. And I can guarantee you, I can call them at any time. And they'll do, they'll do whatever I might need help on. Now they might complain a little bit, but they'll be there. Um, and then this last part in this, this relationship is the parental relationship. And there's something about the parental relationship that is really hard to explain. But, but I think it, well, the best time way to explain this is you'll see uh, people when they do something, they do something wrong. Uh, and you see this often with um, guys that are just involved in crime. And, and especially with late, and they're involved in crime and they have altercation and they get shot. And you know that they're criminal. And, they, and then they interview the mother or father. And he's always such a wonderful person. You know, it just, this is, it's a relationship that um, sees the good in everybody no matter what. That, that's the prayer of relationship. But there's a relationship that is, that's even stronger in a prayer of relationship. And this, this is, uh, let me step back a minute. So why are, or why are we so relational? Why do we have so many th th these uh, relations that we develop over time? Well, you've you got to go back to the beginning. 
where God creates man. And we, he, he, he takes all this stuff, he, he creates the world, he creates the fish, the, the birds, the, the, the mountains, the waters, and then he creates man. And then he takes all these animals and brings them to Adam. And he names them one by one. And, and as he's naming them, Adam starts like, wait a minute, something's not right here. There's nothing that resembles me. Not even orangutans or monkeys or apes or chimpanzees does Adam think resembles him. So the reason why it says that so God creates Eve, brings it to him, but the reason why there was nothing there is because man was created in God's image. We are the only part of creation that was created in his image. It says in the image of God we are created. So that should tell you something about God. If we are relational people, and we're made in His image, we have a very relational God. And He wants to be in relation with us. That's why He created us. But the, 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 if we go back now to this, this most important, what I feel is uh, the most important relationship, and we are in Genesis. We're only going to be there for a second. We're actually, if you look at your notes, and oh yeah, there are two sides of the notes. Um. <laughs> um, and we're going to start in verse 23 of chapter 2 and then, then man said this is from bone of my bone flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh now, as you look at that passage there, and we just talked about how important that parental relationship is, he says the man is to leave his father and mother. So that relationship now is not as important as this relationship of the husband and wife. And it is, uh, God creates man in his image, and after God creates him, it is good. But God says it's not good for man to be alone. So he does create Eve. And um, what we find here, though, is there's a couple things. And uh, your, maybe your passage says, uh, mine says join, maybe your passage says cleave. But the idea of joining is, I, I'm a cabinet maker. And sometimes we have to make big pieces of wood. So we run them on saws, we put a good edge, make sure there's a good edge on both. And then we'll slap some glue on it, and we take clamps and we clamp them together and pressure and leave them in there until the glue dries. And nowadays it dries in about two minutes. The heat and stuff. So you have to work fast. But at that glue and that joint puts together with enough pressure, that joint becomes stronger than the actual wood. It becomes stronger than the actual wood. And, and this thing of cleaving, if you're Verse says cleaving. And this resembles weaving two threads into one new piece of cloth. And this word suggests both passion and permanence. Well, don't miss that last word, permanence. Just like when I join those two pieces of wood together, I want them to last forever. And just like on that thread, we want that cloth to last forever. There's a permanence in that word. Okay? So then we come down to this idea of one flesh. And this is uniting two individuals in a physical union that symbolizes that they become part of each other. Their total unity in their new family. This family is built upon this marriage relationship. This husband-wife relationship. But there's one more thing, and this is where we will spend our time that I believe this is the most important relationship. And that, take, that comes over to Ephesians chapter 5. And if you can turn there, if you want, and you've got the, got the old style where you actually turn pages, or maybe you do that. On your phone or whatever sort of thing, swiping or whatever. And we're going to start in verse 22 of chapter 5. It says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, 
and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body, and here we have already looked at this, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Get this here and listen to this part. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ in the church. Paul is taking this passage of marriage, of this husband-wife relationship, and he is putting it in the same standpoint as the relationship between Christ and the church, between the bridegroom and the bride. So that should tell you how important the marriage relationship is. There's no greater relationship. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, God, that we can be here this morning to study your word. And God, as we look into the principles of marriage that you have created, and Lord, as we look in it, now help an understanding to see what Jesus has done for the church. God, open our hearts so that we can be examples of your word to the world. In his name, amen. You know, most of you know my situation. Uh, coming from being from a divorce. And we come across passages that are hard. Not only are they hard to read, but they're hard to be up here and speak of. But one thing you have to understand is God's word is sufficient for all life. And this is the problem we are coming into with the church. And as you, this passage is tough for me and it's difficult coming from a built marriage. There might be another passage that's more difficult for you. That's not so much a struggle for me. And the tendency when we come to those passages is to flip over. I don't want to hear that right now. But there is so much that we need to learn through them. And we can't skip over God's Word. No matter how hard and how difficult it is. God's Word is sharper to any two-edged sword and it pierces to the soul. It goes deep to the heart. Because God is concerned about the heart. And I'm so glad we don't skip over passages in the Bible. And that's one reason why I love the way Paul takes it and he goes through a book. And we don't skip. Because sometimes when we do subject or topical, you can skip some important things. Don't skip out on what God is trying to tell. But we're not, but we're, we're, this idea of the marriage-husband-wife relationship it, it is prominent here in this passage. But the relationship we're going to look at is that from the bridegroom Christ to the church. And as you see, which the bridegroom Christ relationship is the most important relationship that we have as Christians. But as we look at this, you can see how important the marriage relationship is. So, the first thing we find is that, <clears throat> comes in verse 25, and we're going to look at the, uh, the responsibility of the bridegroom first. And he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loves the church. Christ makes a pledge to the bride to love her. This is a vow. It's a commitment. Jesus as Christ loves the church. No greater love is this than one who lays down his life for his brother. That's the kind of love that Christ has for the church. This is the kind of love that the bridegroom has for the bride. This is agape love. It's unconditional love. <clears throat> it means seeking the highest good for another person. And as Christ, 
he is always seeking the highest good for the church. You know, today we have this idea of dating or courting. Um, some of you younger ones might be involved in that. Some of you may not be old enough yet. Um, but this, in this idea of dating, we, we try to see someone, okay, yeah, I might go out and date this guy. <clears throat> and to see if I like him. So you go out on a date, yeah, I think I kind of like this person. So we go on to another date. I really like this person. So you keep going, you talk to another. I think I might love this person. And as it progresses and progresses, I really love this person. I really hope you would ask me to marry her. Maybe I should ask her to marry me. So, but in, in today's day, you know, we go through this process to see if we like someone, to see if we love someone, to fall in love before we get married. But you see, in this time, marriages were arranged. The bridegroom didn't get the opportunity to, to most of the time, to pick and choose his bride. Most of the time, the father picked for him. And not only did they not have the opportunity to, to love the person beforehand, they were married. Then they had to learn to love through all the problems. Now, here's, here's the this idea of love. You know, if we knew beforehand that this person we were thinking about marrying, if we know ahead of time that they're going to be not nice to us, if we knew ahead of time that they might be um, abusive, if we know ahead of time that they're going to be unfaithful, would we marry them? Probably not. You see, Jesus, he knows that we are going to be disobedient. You see, Jesus knows that we are going to be disrespectful. He knows and knew that we're going to be unloving. He knows and knew that we are going to be unfaithful. And yet, he still is doing all his good for the good of us, the church. That is that unconditional love. He loves us unconditional, despite all our flaws that he knows about ahead of time. That's his unconditional love. The second thing is he pursues his bride. And again, this is from verse 25, it says, Christ loved the church. Who is the one that Christ loved? He loves the church. Jesus took on the form of man, stepped out of his glory, come down to earth in, in the form of flesh to pursue his bride. It is the church that he loved. He humbled himself to come down to this earth. Jesus was a savior and he took on flesh. It is Christ who took the steps to, for the church. The church didn't take the steps to unite us to him. Jesus is the one who took those steps. It is his love for the church. The third thing we see is, again, verse 25, and he, and he, he's Christ who also loved the church and gave himself up for her. He purchased the bride. Jesus gave himself up for the bride. In this time of, of that this thing written, not only did the uh, groom not get to choose his bride, but he also had to pay a price for her. Because this woman that he that was going to be married, she was part of the family, and she had a, a duty in the, to her family that she was. And if she's taken out of it, well, that job's not going to be done. So a, what was called a dowry was paid, and. So, it, whether it was a monetary gift, or a gift of service, or it might have been a gift of, of food, or a livestock, or something of that sort. But a dowry had to be paid for this one. I don't remember having to pay a dowry for my life. And I didn't definitely get any money for her when my daughter got there. <laughs> but I got a pretty good son-in-law, and I got five wonderful grandkids. I guess that kind of weighs that out. But Jesus paid everything he had. 
He paid with His life. He took upon sin for us. That is the ultimate price that He paid. The second, the fourth, fourth thing we find is that He purifies the bride. And this is in verses 26 and 7. So that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, that He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Christ purifies the truth. This idea of washing with water is it's a picture of baptism. And we are baptized into Christ's family. But it is Jesus himself that does the purification. No one else can sanctify or purify the church. It is Christ and Christ alone. How much harder when you start to see what Christ does for the church does it make that for husbands, for wives? It makes it pretty tough. The fifth thing we see <clears throat> comes down to verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. He nourishes and cherishes the bride. The idea of nourishing and cherishing is an ongoing thing, not just a one-time deal. The sanctification and purification, that was one time when Jesus died on the cross, and his blood paid the price for us. This idea of nourishing and cherishing, this is continuing. This is work that he does. And in marriage, there has to be work done. You can't just go and have a big old party and expect everything to be good after that. Because that's when you truly understand the person that is that after the party. Nourishing involves providing security. Cherishing involves protecting by watching out for and caring for you. He nourishes and cherishes the truth. <coughs> See, this is what we find here in the New Testament. And there is also, we get the same picture in the Old Testament. And we're not going to spend too much time there, but in, in, the, in the prophet Hosea. And we find there that, it, it's, it's a, nowadays we're talking about the church going off and committing adultery, spiritual idolatry or adultery. At this time here in Hosea, Israel was going off and they were committing spiritual adultery and idolatry. They were giving in to the foreign gods. And they were putting away what God has told them to do for the sake of these other gods. So God create, goes to Hosea. And he tells Hosea, in order to start in verse 2, he says, When the Lord spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry for the land commits flagrant idolatry. For the sake forsaking the Lord. So he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of the Blaine, and she conceived and bore him a son. So in the first uh, chapter, 2 and 3, Hosea makes a pledge to her. God tells Hosea to do something, and he goes and he takes her. He pledges himself to Gomer. Okay? And then they have a kid, and um, there, there are some thoughts with that she, they have a couple more. And um, as you go down later on, uh, she has two, and they have names. One of them, the first one's named really good. Um, the second two, their names are not so good. So there's an idea and a thought that the possibility that the second two kids were not Hosea's. Uh, but they're not for sure. But nonetheless, from Gomer's um, background, she goes off and she um, runs around again and starts committing uh, adultery. And we pick it up again in chapter 1, or 3, chapter 1. It says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raising kings. So you see, Israel had turned their backs on God. 
They were communing spirits like all of you. And here, the picture of Hosea is that he pursues his wife. Just the same as God pursues Israel. And he pursues her. Verses 2 says, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. Hosea, he pays for her. Now, he only had 15 shekels. And at this time it, 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 that this was took place, to, to buy a slave, it was almost 30 shekels of silver. He only had half. So he had to come up with some barley and, to help pay for what was there. So basically, the idea is that Hosea had to pay everything he had for gold. A wife who was an adulterous woman, just as Israel was an adulterer. And you see God over and over, continually going back to Israel. And verse 3 says, Then I said to her, You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man, so I will also be toward you. And this gives that same picture of as Jose helps to purify. And in the same sense, Hosea is making a note for himself. So you see the same picture in the Old Testament as we see here in the New Testament in Ephesians. So that's the responsibility of the bride. Or the excuse me, the bridegroom. This is what Christ did for the church. And then, as you can see, that's a pretty tough word to live up. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do what we can at every point to not do our best for our bride. So the next thing we're going to look at is what's the bride's responsibility? What is the church's responsibility? So now we come back up to verse 22 at the start of this passage. It says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. The first response for, for, the, for the bride, for the church, is submission. In, in, this, in verse 24, we find that the church is to submit, to be in subject to Christ. Christ is the head. He is the authority over the church. This is a willingly and lovingly submit to Christ as the head. That's submission. And that's the first thing that the church is to do, is to submit to Christ. So what is submitting? Well, submission, it, it comes from, it it's a milit has military origins. And it emphasizing being under the authority of another. This is not a feared submission. Instead, it is a voluntary submission to a proper authority. A voluntary submission to a proper authority. So, here, you have this in your notes. So the first thing is submission. Submission, it begins with an attitude of entrusting oneself to God. And I'm not going to go through the scriptures that I have there. You can look them up for yourself. Um, Christ must be the life focus of the church. Christ must be the life focus of the church. If Christ is not the focus of the church, the church will fail. We've got to keep the focus. Christ has to be the focus. The second thing, it requires respectful behavior. We do see this in verse 33. And see to it, wives, that she respect her husband. There has to be a respectful behavior. This leaves out nagging. This leaves out complaining and whining. God, why do you have me in this situation? Why are things so hard for me and other people they're not? I'll tell you right now, I'm, I, that would hit hard for me. That, I've been guilty of that. Definitely been guilty of that. 
It requires respectful behavior. Three, submission means developing a godly character. Be ye holy for I am holy. Paul says, emulate me as I emulate Christ. It means developing a godly character. Four, submission involves doing what is right. Being obedient to God's word. Submission should not extend to participating in conduct that is contrary to Scripture. It should not be participating in conduct that is contrary to Scripture. And, and we do have a lot of freedom in Christ. And, and you know, there's sometimes a the thought that, well, if you can become a Christian, they will be boring. You know, I'll tell you, you become a Christian, boy, you read life to You better hang on. But our, our conduct should emulate that of Christ. It should emulate that of what's in Scripture. And if something's going on that is contrary to Scripture, we need to... No, I can't participate. And this idea of submission is doing involves doing what is right. It involves doing what is right when nobody is looking. When nobody is looking. The second thing that we find in, in, in of, of the, the, the church's response is that the church is to be faithful. You know, we have this idea of washing with the water through the Word. And again, this gives the idea of baptism. And through baptism, we are putting our faith in Christ and only Christ in that what He did on the cross paid for our sins. So, it, it's a... Um, so as Christ did His work on the cross, we are putting our faith and trust in that. And we are putting our faith and our trust that He is God, that He is Lord over our lives. When two people come together and they get married, they make vows. And quite often the vows used to be till death do us part. And a lot of times nowadays, those vows have been changed for as long as we're happy or as long as we love each other. But unless you have a true understanding of what love is from here, you will fail in that. But this does give an idea of, of faithfulness to the vows we made, of faithfulness as the church is to be to Christ. Because we just see in history, it is Him who pursues us. It was Him who purifies us. The church is to be faithful to Christ. Christ is the head. Well, that's... I lost my paper. Oh, there we go. I don't know why I put it. So he pays for our sins, and we find that also in the Word of God itself. As we read and study, and by having faith and trusting in His Word, it also gives the idea of a pledge or a confession of faithfulness to Christ that we make. You know, but sometimes in marriage, love can be can get divided. Marriage is going to be it, it's difficult. Paul flat out says himself, "I'm just trying to spare you the trouble." It, it, it is difficult. It's hard. And I'll tell you what, as a church, living your life for Christ in, in today's time is hard. Because there is so much out there that is against you. There's so much evil that is out there. And you have to call it what it is. Anything that opposes God's will is evil. And that's part of some of what we're, the church is not doing. It, it, it's, we, we've kind of gotten away from this term of evil. But anything that is in opposition to God is out there. And that this is what Satan does. And he tries to destroy our lives. He tries to get in and destroy marriages. And we find what happens here in 2 Corinthians. 
chapter 11. Verses 2 and 3. And this is Paul writing. And you see some of the tones that he writes here to the church of Corinth that we see here. In verse 2 he starts off, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. By his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. <coughs> that piece of wood that we joined together to start. And, and my time of, I've been cabinet for about probably 30 years now. And over time, we do make mistakes and we put wood in the wrong spot. <laughs> We have learned how to manipulate those joints, to break those joints without damaging the wood. And we can do that about 60% of the time because we have learned how to manipulate that joint. We have learned how to put pressure in the right exact spot. And sometimes all it takes is a little tap of the hammer. You see, that's what that's what Satan does, according to that passage. You know, God created everything. He created all the heavens. He created the earth. He, the fish, the sea, the birds, the animals, the, the water, the earth. Who does, he, who does Satan attack? He attacks man. Why? Because man was made in God's image. Because man was made to have a relationship with God. He didn't attack the other stuff. He attacked the man. And then we see all through Scripture how he attacks Israel. And then as Christ comes, we see in the, in the time in, in the Gospels the attacks that were, that were put on Jesus. And, and then afterwards, if you come into the time of the church, which we are still in, and you can blatantly see the attacks of Satan on the church. And some of those are little things. Well, we don't, we, we don't preach that here because we don't want to offend those people. Some things are hard to talk about. Some things are hard to share. But God's Word is God's Word. And that is, when we make that oath as a church to Him, we are making to follow His ways. To be in submission to Christ. Chuck Swindoll, he, he states it this way, and I like how he writes this. And he says that on this passage, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, 4. And he writes, As I have meditated on this verse throughout my life, I have come to realize that it is perhaps one of the most significant warnings in the entire Bible concerning spiritual warfare. Satan's major thrust into the experience of Christians is to cause our mind to stray from devotion to Jesus Christ into all sorts of other avenues, even ones, now listen to this, even ones that seem wise. You see, Satan knows Scripture too. And he, again, he knows in marriages, he knows how the, the right buttons to push to cause conflict, to cause trouble in marriages. And he knows the right buttons to push in the church. And even some that seem wise. Well, God loves everybody. Well, yeah, he does. But you've got to see the whole thing. He hates sin. And he, because of his love, he doesn't want to walk in sin. So Satan's out there. We have to be aware of it. And we have Christ. We have God to, to help us through that. So, in, in concluding here, some things that we need to do. The first thing is we need to get to know the bridegroom. We need to, we need to know everything about the bridegroom. The same with marriages. We need to know our spouses. We need to know them. Spend time with them. 
So we need to study and read, meditate on God's Word. We need to talk to the bright. We need to be in constant prayer. And sometimes that's hard because I know for me personally, sometimes I'm tired. I don't feel like it tonight. I'm not in a great mood. I don't feel like it. But we can't do that. And that, you know, sometimes we do that with our spouses. We can't do that. We need to take time to spend time with them in prayer. And the third thing is we need to submit to the authority of the bridegroom. Be, we need to be obedient to the Word of God. We need to love the Word of God. And we don't try, and we shouldn't try to add to it or take away from it. Folks, I, I know I've said this before, but this is sufficient for all of us. It is sufficient for all of us. And we have strength in Christ that we can get through our tough times. Let's pray. Father, sometimes good passages can be difficult, but you have put them down in this book for a reason. And I'm so thankful that we don't step, skip over or trip over them or pass over them or whatever. But through our passage today, Lord, we find out how awesome Christ is, how awesome Jesus is, how much He loves us so much that He gave everything for our life. That He pursued us even knowing our faults. That he still loved us despite our faults. So, Father, as we go out from here, I pray, Lord, as the, we are the church, that we would submit to the authority of Christ. That we would be faithful in our walk with him. That we would be faithful in the way we live our lives. Yes. That as other people see us, they would see you through that. Be with us, Lord, as we, you go out. In Jesus' name, amen.